Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. I was excited to speak with our guest today. Dr. Glenn Livingston is a licensed psychologist who specializes in working with clients who struggle with binge eating behaviors, which also includes pathologies like stress eating, boredom eating, and emotional eating, which many of our clients can tend to struggle with. In fact, he wrote the book on it, Never Binge Again. This book does not dance around how to nurture one out of binge eating patterns. It takes a tough love approach, which Dr. Livingston believes is absolutely necessary in dealing with the root causes of binge eating. You'll learn a lot about the parts of the brain that control or ask for binge behavior and how our modern food environment is set up to make it a lot harder to moderate consumption. It's a deep conversation that covers a lot of bases. I've got a quick promo message and then we'll be on our way with this episode. We've recently launched something that we're pretty excited about and want to share with you. My Primal Coach is a convenient app-based health coaching program that delivers daily lessons with actionable tips for losing weight, gaining strength and energy, sleeping better, managing stress, and more. It provides personal one-on-one coaching to help you stay on track and reach your wellness goals in just 12 weeks. My Primal Coach is delivered by the team behind the Primal Health Coach Institute, the first and preeminent ancestral health coaching school in existence. We've trained and certified thousands of successful health coaches across 75 countries around the world, and we're experts in behavior change. We understand how to get the clients the results they desire. Our mission at My Primal Coach is the same as our mission with Primal Health Coach Institute, to help 100 million people reclaim health and wellness through education and coaching. Check it out for yourself at myprimalcoach.com. We'd love to see who's listening out there, so please take a screen grab of your podcast player and tag us on Instagram at Health Coach Radio. Don't forget, you can always find the show notes for this episode and all previous episodes of Health Coach Radio at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. With all of that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Please welcome our guest today, Dr. Glenn Livingston. Dr. Livingston, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to have you. Laura and Erin, I'm very happy to be here. I've been looking forward to it all week and please call me Glenn. All right, Glenn, Glenn it is. So um, Erin and I are familiar with your work and I'm sure some of our listeners will be familiar with your work, but Mm -hmm. lo and behold, no doubt there's a few out there that aren't. So would you mind just giving us, I don't know, a bit of a, like a five minute backstory about who you are and how you landed here? So I'm a psychologist, and I'm actually a child and family psychologist by training. I had a large practice on Long Island about 20 years ago or so. Um, However, I was also a binge eater, and it was the bane of my existence for 20, 25 years, starting from when I was about 17, and I managed to clean the Great Neck Delis out of pizza and Pop-Tarts. I I figured out I'm I'm 6'4", I'm modestly muscular without doing much about it. And I um, forgot if I worked out a couple hours a day, I could eat whatever I wanted to. And that was really great when I was a teenager. It was kind of like a superpower. You know, whole, whole pizzas, boxes of muffins, boxes of donuts, six chocolate bars. If it wasn't nailed down, then it was in my mouth. Um, but I thought it was great. I didn't really get fat back then. But when I got older and I was 22, 23, and I was married, and I was commuting two hours a day in each direction to see patients and go to school and coming home and helping to run the business. And then, God forbid, my ex-wife wanted to talk to me. Um, you know, I just didn't have the time to work out. But I found that the food still had a hold of me. And I'd be you know, sitting with a suicidal client and thinking, when can I get the next pizza? Mm-hmm. And that I never lost anybody. Um, but it really bothered me because I'm a fam- from a family of 17 psychologists. And that's the only thing that was ever important to me. Um, you know, kind of a joke about it is if something breaks in the household, we would all rush and ask it how it feels and nobody knows how to fix it. So <laughs> my, my life was about psychology. Um, to be a great psychologist, you need to lend people your soul. It's not so much of an intellectual endeavor. 
as, as it is about getting people to love and trust you enough that they're willing to step out of their comfort zones and see things they couldn't see before. Um, it helps to be smart. It helps to read a lot, but it's really about being present. And I couldn't do it 100% because um, I was distracted thinking about food all the time. And I, I took a very psychological route to try and fix it. I went to see the best psychologist in New York because you'd figure I would know them in that family. I talked about my childhood. I tried to figure out where the hole was in my heart so I could stop feeding the hole in my stomach. I went to a psychiatrist. They took medication. I went to Overeaters Anonymous for a few years. It was a very soulful, spiritual journey, which I don't regret taking. And I learned an awful lot about myself along the way. But nothing really seemed to fix anything. I would get a little thinner and a lot fatter and a little thinner and a lot fatter. It kind of went up and down for a while, but on a very steady upward trend. My top was probably about 280, although I stopped weighing myself at 257. And um, I had a lot of health issues. My, my triglycerides were over 1,000, and the doctors were yelling at me um, you know, that I was going to die by the time I was 40, and it, it didn't seem to matter. I just kept on going you know, a little better, a lot worse, a little better, a lot worse. Well, there were two things that really changed my mind about the paradigm. So that ultimately would solve it for me was not really a love yourself thin paradigm, but more of an alpha wolf paradigm, like taking control of the challengers in the pack. And those challengers were those thoughts in my head that suggested that I break all my best laid plans. The, the really three things, the three things that convinced me that I needed to have more of a tough love approach than a, um, than a nurture your inner wounded child approach were that I was doing consulting for industry. I, I didn't commute. My ex-wife traveled a lot for business. We had a lot of time on my hands and we didn't have kids because she was traveling. So I wound up doing a lot of consulting for the big food industry and, and big pharma. And I feel like I was on the wrong side of the war, mm -hmm. um, but I did it. And I saw them engineering, like spending millions, if not billions of dollars engineering these hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and excitotoxins and, and salt. And, 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 and they were all geared towards hitting the bliss point in your reptilian brain without giving you enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And what's the result of that? Well, every time you're looking for love at the bottom of a bag or a box or a container, there's some fat cat in a white suit with a mustache that's laughing all the way to the bank, right? Mm, yeah. um, it's just an overwhelming force. The other thing that helped me to flip the paradigm was to understand that the lizard brain, which is the seat of our emergency response system, right? And this is what this is what this really seems to be responsible in addiction. The lizard brain knows fight or flight, knows feast or famine, knows hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. It doesn't know love. So it, when, when it looks at something in the environment, it's thinking to itself, excuse my fist to illustrate the lizard brain, do I eat it, do I meet with it, or do I kill it? It's like a bad college drinking game. Eat, mate, or kill, right? I, I, there's no love there. Love is a function of the mammalian brain that says, wait a minute, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, um, hold on and decide what impact is this going to have on the people that you love on your tribe, on your family. Then there's the neocortex, which um, is either the latest evolved or something that God put there. Um, but regardless of how it got there, its function allows, among many, is to inhibit the rest of our impulses and say, wait a minute, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact does that have on your longer term goals? What about the kind of person you want to be in society? What about your spirituality and your art and your music? And all these things that we think of when we think usually think about depth psychology or think about just being human, um, it's mostly because the neocortex holds that in mind and um, modulates or regulates the lower brain functions. So I said, wow, the neocortex is really the alpha dog. The last thing that, the last thing that really talked me out of that paradigm was this study that I did for myself with 40,000 people. Because I was getting paid a lot of money to do these studies and internet clicks were cheap back then. This was like mm -hmm. 1998, 99. And over several years, I asked 40,000 people what they were feeling stressed about when they were searching for stress solutions and what foods they turned to that they couldn't stop eating once they started. And I found that people who were stressed about um, 
something at work. They tended to binge on um, crunchy, salty things like potato chips and pretzels. People that were stressed about something at home, usually with family and children, they tended to binge on soft, chewy, starchy things like pizza and pasta and bagels. And people who were stressed about their relationship, who were feeling lonely or brokenhearted or a little depressed, um, which I was at the time, they tended to start with chocolate and they couldn't stop, couldn't stop eating chocolate. And so I said, aha, not, now I'm getting to the bottom of this. This was like the very end of my psychological search. And so I called my mom, who's also a therapist and, is, and also a chocoholic. My binges always started with chocolate and then they proceeded to pizza and everything else. Um, and I said, mom, you know, I have this pattern, you know, I'm not really happy in the relationship, um, but I'm still working on fixing that. But I want to understand what happened in my upbringing where I would run to chocolate as soon as I felt depressed or unhappy or, and, and, or lonely. And she gets this horrible look on her face. This was over Skype. And she says, I'm so sorry, honey. And I said, mom, it's okay. You know, this was decades ago. This was ages ago. I totally forgive you. I just want to figure it out. And she said, honey, I'm so sorry. But when you were one year old in 1965, your dad was a captain in the army. And they were talking about sending him to Vietnam. And I was terrified. I thought I'm going to be an army widow with, you know, one small baby and a baby in my belly. And because we were trying to get pregnant with your sister. And I was nervous all the time. I was anxious all the time. At the same time, my father, your grandfather, had just gotten out of prison. And you know that I idolized your grandfather my whole life. And I didn't know that he'd gotten out of prison. I didn't know he was guilty. And he was. He was doing these things. And he had disappeared for a couple of years. And he just came back. And so most of the time, when you came running to me for love or to play or for some healthy food or just a hug, I didn't have it to give you. I was sitting and staring at the wall, feeling almost suicidally depressed all the time and anxious. So what I did was I kept a big bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup in a refrigerator on the floor. And I'd say, honey, go get your Bosco. And you'd go crawling over to the refrigerator and you'd open it up and you'd suck on the bottle and go into a chocolate sugar coma. Mm. And yeah, so, so that's, um, I've told the story before, so I, I'm not quite as emotional as I used to be about it, but it was, it was a movie moment. It was a, a moment where you'd expect, if we were in the movies, that mom and I would have a big hug and a big cry, and then I'd forgive her and I'd forgive myself and I'd never have chocolate again, right? Or I'd never have trouble with it again. Well, I mean, it was a good, it was a good conversation to have. I, it led to a, a lot of other questions about what my mother's life was like at that time. I learned a lot about her, I learned a lot about myself. I forgave myself. So it, it took away a lot of that uh, self-punitive, self-castigative voice that occurred after a mistake. But my actual chocolate eating got worse. Mm. Here's why. Um, it's like from that point on, there was a voice in my head that said, you know what, Glenn, you're right. Our mama didn't love us enough, and she left a great big chocolate-sized hole in your heart. So until you can find the love that you need, you're going to have to go right on binging on chocolate. Yippee, let's go get some right now. So it was a voice of justification. And that totally upended my understanding of the relationship between emotions and overeating. So, so here I figured out, you know, we didn't even talk about the big advertising industry, but, but industry was spending millions of dollars to override my better judgment, having nothing to do with what happened with my mother. So not anything internal. Um, then I figured out that the part of the brain they're targeting doesn't even know love. So how am I going to fix this with love if, I'm, if it doesn't even know love? And then I figured out that I've got this, it's like, I've got this fire I'm trying to put out. If you figure out the emotions or the fire, most people make the assumption in our culture that emotions um, are the cause of overeating. Emotions are burning down the house. But then I realized that emotions can't burn down the house if there's a really good fireplace that contains it. Hmm. And you could have a roaring fire in a well-contained fireplace. And that becomes the center of hearth and home. It's an asset, not a liability. People gather around, they tell stories, they hug, they make memories, they laugh, they cry. And it's only if there's a hole in the fireplace 
that ashes can get out and burn down the house. So I thought, that was the moment when I said, maybe I can fix the holes in the fireplace and not worry so much about the emotion. Maybe I can just contain this. And yes, I'll still go to therapy and try to work out my life and everything like that. But maybe it has nothing to do with overeating. So this is the embarrassing part. Um, I decided that that inner voice, that voice of justification, now, remember, I was not going to be teaching this. This was just a very private try to fix up. I decided that was my inner pig, and it was poking holes <laughs> in the fireplace. And I made very clear rules about what was healthy and unhealthy behavior. So, for example, one of my first rules was I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. I only, only ever eat chocolate on Saturday or Sunday. And that way, if I heard a voice in my head that said, go ahead, Glenn, I know it's Wednesday, but you worked out hard enough. You're not going to gain any weight. It's just as easy to start tomorrow. Yippee, let's go get some right now. I would say, wait a minute. That's not me. That's my inner pig. And it's squealing for pig slop. Chocolate is pig slop on a Wednesday. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. <laughs> as ridiculous as that sounds, as crude. I, I mean, I'm a sophisticated psychologist. You, you heard my credentials and everything I've been through in, in life and I was busy there saying to myself, pig slop, I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And it, I was not instantaneously cured. I don't want to mislead people. What did happen instantaneously was that all of the muck got cleared away. I no longer thought I was powerless. I was no longer confused about what was going on. It would give me these extra microseconds at the moment of impulse to wake up and remember why I made the decision in the first place and, and make the right choice. Um, over time, I started to keep a journal about the things that the pig said. So, so it did help me to make the right decision more, off, more often than not. I still was making bad decisions. Once I would just say, I don't need pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. Because it's like I recognized that the, the reptilian brain was active. Mm -hmm. um, over time, I would write down specifically what it said, and I would fix the hole. I'd fix the hole in the fireplace. So for example, it's not just as easy to start tomorrow. The principle of neuroplasticity says what fires together, wires together. If you have a craving for chocolate and you eat chocolate, that craving will be stronger tomorrow. So if you're in a hole, stop digging, always use the present moment to be healthy. See, so I, I disempowered the thing that was greasing the chute or poking the hole in the fireplace. I fixed the hole in the fireplace. Um, the more holes that I fixed, the easier it was to stay on my plan. I found that every rule came with its own set of holes. So I just, I kept the journal and there were all these things. It was just me versus my pig for about eight years. It was probably about a thousand pages. Um, as I'm getting divorced in 2015, I wound up as a minor partner in a publishing company in addition to some other things that I was doing. And I had to close down some other business that I was um, running. I was running a coach training organization with my ex-wife at the time. And, um, and, and the CEO of the publishing company called me and said, we really need to publish our own books. So we, we can do some really great marketing experiments and attract more high-end authors. I said, okay. So I've got this journal that I kept for eight years, but it's really crazy. It's about me versus my inner pig. He says, I love it. Turn it into a book. <clears throat> so I take the summer and I turn, this was 2015, I take the summer, I turn it into a book and I send it to him. I don't hear from him for about two weeks. And then he calls me all of a sudden and he says, Glenn, I don't eat donuts. Donuts are pig slop. I don't let the farm animals tell me what to do. <laughs> and apparently he hadn't had a donut for two weeks. He proceeds to lose almost 100 pounds. Um, along the way, we did just what he said. We published the book. It took a while to take off. We went the long road and, you know, we methodically called reviewers and we did all the right things like none of the shortcuts and um now there are over a million copies distributed and i could be in a bookstore and people don't really know my name but they recognize me they see me on a podcast or something and they go pig guy <laughs> <laughs> which is a really great thing you want to happen on a first date it's a it's just fantastic so so that, that's what we do. And so, so now I run a, um, now I go around the world. I've written six more books on binge eating specialty topics and um, I run a little boutique coaching agency. That's what I do now. Wow. Okay. Yeah. This is a lot. This is so good. Yeah. Um, okay. There's just so many things here that um, health practicing and aspiring health, fitness, and nutrition coaches, our audience can 
probably relate to, um, if not within themselves, but with the clients they're they're um, engaging with on, the, on a regular basis. It's interesting. I forgot that the inner pig part when I had heard you on a previous podcast that so I had to, I had to laugh. One of the phrases that I've inadvertently popularized in my practice is like a grown ass adult. <laughs> so and like making food decisions, like a grown ass adult, not like an unsupervised five-year-old. So it, it is a tough love approach too. And I think, I think a lot of coaches shy away from tough love because, because there is all this lore about the wounded inner child and, you know, the holes in your heart. So do you ever find this? So, because I know you are, you, you have a boutique coaching agency and you also train coaches. So I'm assuming that you train coaches and you yourself utilize this tough love approach. How do, how does that resonate with clients or patients? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of our clients come to us after they've read the book and they already resonate with it. So we don't necessarily hear from the people who don't. But I've done a lot of interviews and I've taken a lot of questions from people who it hits abrasively. Um, so let me just say that this is akin to um, taking control over, over other bodily functions. So if this is not unique in our world, we, we take control of our bladders. If, if I really had to pee right now, I would tell my bladder, I'm sorry, I hear you, I will take care of you, but I need to finish this interview first. If there's an attractive woman on the street, I don't run out and, and kiss her. Um, there are ways to talk to people. I, I mostly avoid that because I'm shy. <laughs> but um, but, but um, there, you know, there, there are ways to, in the natural course of socialization and living in a, in a civilization and a society that we're expected to control our bodily impulses. When you have an understanding of this is a bodily impulse, it's nothing more than, than that. You're separating the thoughts that serve the emergency function versus the thoughts that really serve your long-term function. Um, the problem is that, well, I'm gonna finish a couple of things if I can have a minute or two. Yeah. To, okay. Of course. Yeah. Um, think about a child learning to control their, their bowels. Mm -hmm. um, when a child is finally potty trained, their freedom expands. Now they can go to school. Now, now they can go to their friend's house and, house and play. They feel really proud of themselves. You know, who's a big girl? Who's a big boy, right? Mm -hmm. So by learning to take control over that, they, their sense of self-efficacy expands, their sense of self-esteem expands. It doesn't degrade them, it, it makes them feel better about themselves. And I, you know, I record a lot of coaching sessions, I put them on my podcast and everything, because a lot of people think this must be a really harsh approach, but it's actually a very compassionate, life-giving, um, hope-restoring approach. Secondly, um, most people don't understand that the reptilian brain is not really part of our identity. It's it's really more of a bodily organ mm -hmm. and that, that our identity lives more in the neocortex. And so once people understand that, I say, go ahead and nurture your inner wounded child all that you want to, just understand where it lives. So th this is more like training a muscle than nurturing your inner wounded child. Thirdly, um, it's the nature of addiction is in an emergency survival drive that's been corrupted. I think it's been corrupted by industry for a profit, but in one sense or another, it's making a biological error. It really thinks that all of the nutrition is in the pizza and pasta and Pop-Tarts. It really mm -hmm. believes that. And at the moment, it feels like an emergency, right? And so the way that the brain works, when the reptilian brain takes over, all of, the, all of your best thinking goes out the window. So you, you really need something aggressive to wake up at that moment of impulse. Mm -hmm. you, you need to be able to recognize and take control at that moment of impulse. And you're, best, you're not gonna be able to remember all the reasons at that moment, right? You wanna go, oh my God, that's my pick. I, like now I know this is why this works. I didn't know why that worked back then. Um, okay, then the last thing is, there is a misperception about the nature of emotional eating in the culture. Okay. Most people think you have the emotions to fire and that causes overeating. Most people don't understand about the fireplace, but what they also don't understand is that overeating causes emotions. Mm -hmm. So let's take anxiety, for example. Um, there are physiological correlates of anxiety. 
there is elevated respiration, perspiration, galvanic skin response, and blood pressure. Um, I think I said perspiration. In animal studies, when you look at those correlates, they can be conditioned by providing a sugar reward. So for example, baboons can be taught to have consistently high blood pressure if you reward them with sugar every time they have high blood pressure. Um, you, you can condition, we can't ask the baboons, are you feeling anxious or not? We just assume that all of those things are similar. So you can condition anxiety. People think they can't get to sleep without binging because they're too, they're too anxious. But what if the binging was causing the anxiety in the first place? So this is a two-way relationship. It's not, yeah. just a one, it's not just a one-way relationship. That's a piercing insight because people think that the, the binging reduces the anxiety, but it really, it really raises it overall and it reduces a little bit at the moment. Same with smoking, by the way. If you look at, uh, if you look at the anxiety levels of smokers, the anxiety levels of smokers are higher than non-smokers overall, but when they smoke, it comes down a little bit. And so it creates this false perception, this false causal inference, which isn't really the case. Erin, you look confused. Am I? Oh, I, I wanted to ask a very, like, jump with a very quick um, follow-up on this since we're on this. So let's go with this anxiety example. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is the loop, is, is, is the loop like this? Um, is, is the, okay, let's say anxiety is the feeling and let's say what would be a food, whatever, chocolate, candy, something candy is the thing that the person leads to is, is the body, is the, is the mind triggering anxiety? So you'll go get the candy. So it can self-fulfill the prophecy of anxiety. Um, I don't know if the mind is thinking I want to self-fulfill the prophecy, right. but mm -hmm. I, I, I do believe that the mind can create anxiety or exacerbate anxiety. Uh, there are a whole bunch of causes of anxiety, but I think the mind can in intensify anxiety mm -hmm. so that you will get the sugar reward. So you'll get the candy. Um, yeah. And so, there, there are so many people that come to mind for me. That's why I, I'm being very quiet and I'm writing a lot of notes and I, I might have these weird facial expressions because everything you're saying, I'm going ding, ding, ding. Like I'm identifying clients that I've worked with or am working with currently people in my own family that I'm like, that, and I keep coming up with these questions and then we go down another awesome conversation <laughs> and, I, and I lost it, but there's so much to dig in here but I want to make sure I'm kind of understanding how all of this is kind of functioning together kind of neurologically that at the end of the day, we've got this lizard brain, right? This portion of us that, that really isn't our identity, uh, but it's where essentially our survival instincts are. And to mm -hmm. your point, I mean, I've, I've read many books and I've heard many speakers that speak to big, how big food really exploits this, right? So yeah. they're, they're, so from a, from the standpoint of manufacturing their food, they're exploiting this part of the brain. And then you have their messaging that's exploiting another part of the brain about fun and love and gathering and all this other stuff that perpetuates this problem. So you've got from a coaching perspective, it's, first of all, we can, some of that can be impacted just biochemically by making the right choices. But if we can't make the right choices because other aspects of the brain are triggering us to make different choices, now we have this negative feedback loop. So if I'm hearing you correctly, where from a coaching perspective and a psychological perspective, it's inner, somehow throwing a wrench in this cycle a little bit, right? But, but, Interrupting yeah. it somehow. You, you want to aggressively interrupt it. And then do you want to finish? Because it sounds like I overtalked you. Oh, so, you go ahead. So you want to aggressively interrupt it. And you don't have to call it a pig if that bothers you. That's just what I call it. You can call it your food monster or your wild boar. Just don't make it a cute pet that you want to nurture because that doesn't work. Um, but that's only the first step. Then what you want to do is teach your clients to get out of the emergency response system and activate the parasympathetic nervous system. That's, that's the part that says it's okay to rest and digest. There are no emergencies. Um, easier said than done, but once you're awake, then you say, okay, I'm gonna take a few 7-Eleven breaths. What that means, Lori Hammond taught me this, is if you breathe in for a count of seven, I'm not gonna do it now because it'll take more time, and you breathe out for a count of 11, and you do that several times, you'll find that very calming because if you think about it, if there was an emergency, 
if a hungry bear were chasing you, you wouldn't have time to breathe out for longer than you were breathing in. You'd be breathing in for longer than you were breathing out because you'd be trying to get as much oxygen into your system as possible. So you do that. Then I have them carry around a piece of paper and a pencil or a smartphone with them so they can write down very specifically what their pig is saying. Now, in and of itself, even if you don't know how to fix the hole in the fireplace for the specific thing your pig is saying, and we can, we can talk about the different things it says and how to fix it, but even if you don't know why the pig is wrong, the act of writing is an upper brain activity. So that, that moves the battlefield and takes you more into your rational brain. And your rational brain is more active when you have time to rest and digest and don't feel like there's an emergency. So now you've done a couple of things that have brought you, you to that level. And you write down what the pig's saying in full. So it's just as easy to start tomorrow. Just one bite, just one bite won't hurt. Um, chocolate comes from a coca bean and that grows on a plant. So therefore it's a vegetable. <laughs> what, 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 whatever the pig is saying, you write, you write them all down. And um, then you take another few breaths and then you look for the holes. Then you look for what's wrong in what the pig is saying. It usually wins by telling a half truth and a bigger lie. So it actually seems like it would be just as easy to start tomorrow. You're not going to gain any weight. You worked out hard enough. That's probably true. If I only had, you know, one bar of chocolate, of course, right. it would turn into six for me. Um, and then you, you write down why it's wrong and you take another breath. And then what you want to do is link it to some part of your big why. We have very specific ways of developing big whys, but how is it going to make you a happier, better person if you don't have chocolate right now? Um, you know, for me, it's because I can walk in the world as a tall, fit man, um, able to walk the walk and be a leader and not be frightened of diabetes and cardiovascular disease and everything like that. And ev every time that I keep the pig in a cage, I'm one step closer to accomplishing all that I want to accomplish in that. Um, and so you're kind of bringing your big why into the present moment. Mm -hmm. you're, you're bringing your, because you don't want to just walk around following a bunch of rules with, you know, as if there's a Nazi policeman watching you. Right. Um, you, you really want to have a carrot that's pulling you forward too. And mm -hmm. then the last thing is, what does my body authentically need? Is this, is this a genuine hunger drive misdirected? Um, very often, very often people who overeat are also very good dieters and they follow the old nursery rhyme that says when she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was hard. Oh, yeah. And the solution is not to get good at being very, 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 very good. The solution is to lower the bar enough that you get control and flood your body with nutrition uh, at a slight caloric deficit if you need to lose weight and eat regular, reliable meals to keep your blood sugar even. You have to take care of your authentic needs. So part of getting off chocolate for me, I eventually decided to get off it altogether. My, my clients largely don't. Most of my clients keep eating some of, they prefer to moderate than to abstain, but some people have to abstain. Um, I was someone who tried 28 ways to Sunday to figure out how I could keep chocolate in my life and I just couldn't. Yeah. Um, but one of the ways that I got off it was I realized that I needed some nutrition. And eventually, when I would really have the craving for chocolate, I would go and make myself a kale banana smoothie, sometimes with a little celery juice. And the best way I could describe it is that it scratched the itch so that the itch wasn't bothering me. I didn't get high with food the same way that I was with the chocolate bar. I mean, we didn't have chocolate bars and pizza and Pop-Tarts on the Savannah, right? And in fact, we didn't have emotional eating on the Savannah. Like emotional eating really is a product of all the delicious things that we concentrate and, and overstimulate yeah. ourselves with today. Um, but, but, you know, what, what, what do I really need? What does my body really need? And then I wouldn't get high with it, but I would feel contempt. And that was enough. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's part of maturity. I, I think that as you grow, um, Aaron, what was your phrase? again? I really like that. T treat yourself like a grown ass grown adult. Grown ass adult. Grown yeah. ass adult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I wonder how much, um, gosh, I, I, I just, speaking of the term addiction, you know, growing up when I was a kid, I never really heard that term all that often. And when somebody was an alcoholic or an addict, it, it was, it was, it wasn't something that was in my universe that I was aware of, probably because I was a child, they didn't talk to me about it. 
But I also feel as though over the last, I mean, I'm 50 now, so really 40, 30, I, I, I definitely think it's, there's, it's either a more greatly recognized now and more readily talked about, or it truly is just more prevalent because of the rise of processed food and how much of it kind of people are eating. And I don't, I, one of the, I think the biggest services we can provide our client is a space to talk about it because there's so much shame in binge eating and addictive behaviors that it gets brushed under the rug that it, and it just continues to perpetuate in the darkness versus if you can bring it to light and talk about it without shame. And this is what coaches can do is like, no judgment. This is a judgment-free zone. We're just talking through it and giving the client the opportunity to acknowledge it for what it is and stop blaming themselves that addiction comes from someplace deep within us. And to use some of your term about this reptilian brain, like it's built in there. Yeah. And we need to almost retrain the other parts of our brain to try to help overcome it. And so one of the tools I use with my clients, and I, I never really realized what it was doing until we had this conversation was the idea of when I hear it, I, I always thought of it in terms of just negative self-talk. I'm the kind of person that can't walk past the donut shop, right? Or whatever it is. And I would just stop them in their tracks and say, is that really true? <laughs> well, yes, because every time I walk past a donut shop, I go inside and it's like, okay, so Let's imagine for a minute it's not true. And you're to say that phrase out loud. Let's look for a piece of evidence that can make that not true. And let's try to perpetuate that. Let's try to practice that. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was the whole point of that was to try to get my client to take ownership and, and think in positive terms instead of negative terms. But I can see this as a really handy tool from an, from this addictive sort of reptilian brain perspective of we minutes, let's stop it. Let's interrupt it and make it untrue. Mm-hmm. I, th- this is what I'm taking from the stories you're telling. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so first but, of all, yeah, I think that once you, once you understand the bifurcated nature of the brain, that there's the lower brain and there's the upper brain and that it's uh, responsible for the addictive nature of our behavior that you can start to overcome the shame by recognizing it's not really you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not really, this is not everything that you value about yourself. Secondly, this is a piercing insight. Um, the shame that we feel after a binge or after a serious overeating episode is actually the reptilian brain trying to make us feel too weak to resist doing it more. Um, think about it for a second. Mm-hmm. rationally, there's a place for shame and guilt in the world. It's not anywhere near what overeaters exaggerate it to be. Mm-hmm. But let's say I touched a hot stove by accident. I want to feel that pain because if I don't feel the pain, I don't know where the hot stove is and I don't know how to avoid touching it the next time. Mm-hmm. I just there are, there are disorders where kids are born without the ability to feel pain and they don't stay alive very long because they don't know where the sharp edges are, right? Um, But once you know where the stove is and you figure out how you missed it and you make plans to avoid it in the future, there's no purpose to continuing to feel the pain. It's it's not, it's not valuable. That's what it's like with guilt and shame about overeating. Um, If you're aiming at the bullseye and you miss the bullseye, you want to figure out in what direction did I miss and by how much you want to pay attention and take it seriously. You want that feedback so you can make adjustments but then you want to get up and aim with all of your being again, letting go of that shame, because that shame is only going to distract you and wear down your energy for aiming at the bullseye again. So we need to understand that the, the, the rational purpose of shame and guilt is really minuscule, and the, the adaptive evolutionary purpose of it is really minuscule in the, the situation. Secondly, I think we're told the wrong thing in our culture about what's causing this. You know, if, if you talk to the addictive experts, a lot of the addictive experts will say, well, it's really kind of a chronic progressive mysterious disease that there's no human defense for and you have to go to these programs and, and, and um, there's not really evidence for that. I mean, I, people that are in those programs and it's working with them, then, you know, God bless, please stay with it. But there's not evidence for that. There's not evidence that it really does any better than doing 
nothing at all. Um, so secondly, I don't think that, so I don't think that we, I set myself up with the wrong frame. <laughs> I, this is just the end of that conversation. I, I don't think that we have a disease. I think we have healthy appetites that are corrupted by industry. Hmm. Um, and I, I think that part of recovery involves shifting shame into anger. Th this shouldn't be happening. We, there should be more regulation and protection against. I don't think the people that are doing it are evil because they're doing what the consumer wants. What the consumer wants is not really healthy food. What they really want is plausible deniability. Oh, these chips are made with avocado oil, right? right. And so, I mean, maybe it's better than making it with lard, but but um, it's still, you know, the potato chips are still way over salted and too many right. calories in a small space and yeah. acrylamides from the, the roasting process and which are carcinogenic, all, all those things. Um, which is not to say you can't have potato chips if you really want to once in a while, but you shouldn't fake yourself out and believe that you're having something healthy. Um, okay. The last thing I want to say is that recovering from a binge involves collecting much more so evidence of success rather than failure. So maybe you had five cupcakes instead of 15. How come? Maybe you stopped the binge after 10,000 calories instead of 20,000 calories. How did you do that? If you keep asking, why can't I stop eating? Why can't I stop eating? Which is the number one question I get all day long. And I, one more person, one, per, one more person asks me that I think I'm going to climb up on top of a deer, of a, of a whatever, <laughs> <laughs> aluminum foil on my head and I'll just start screaming. Yeah. It, when, when you ask, why can't I stop eating? You're instructing your brain to collect evidence that you can't stop eating. And as a result, you'll develop a failure identity. If you say, how can I stop this? what can I learn from this episode? Then you will develop a successful identity. And to go back to what you were saying, Laura, about what you tell your clients, you know, how can I make this not true? When the person says, I, I'm just the kind of person who can't walk by a donut shop and not have a donut. Well, you could say, I am becoming a person who walks by donut shops and can't have a donut. And then your brain starts looking for all this evidence about how to become a person who walks by a donut shop and, and not do that. So I could tell you more stories about what the advertising industry is doing along those mm -hmm. lines, but um, I'll stop there. Well, I think that's important that the, the identity statements that clients present with, and it's you know, how this is limiting their, their potential yeah. for growth. Uh, oh gosh, I have, I have a million and a half questions. I know, okay. me too. So, uh, so going back to shame and guilt, and this is so like when I think about the clients that I work with, none of them are presenting and telling me they're addicted. I'm not, they're not saying I'm addicted to, but they're definitely mired in shame and guilt for their food choices. So the way I'm interpreting what you're saying, and by the way, you've, you've stumbled across a couple of like evolutionary biology nerds. So we're really oh, feeling cool. this whole yeah, survival, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. like okay. this whole survival thing. We are, we are, I mean, honestly, I'm always telling my clients, like your body just wants to know that it's safe. It just, that's what it's looking for is the signs that it's safe. Right. Anyway. So the shame and guilt thing is interesting. Cause it's like, it's almost like shame and guilt is sort of like pain like, let's go with this pain. So I wrote it down like pain. Psychological pain. pain. To, yeah. yeah. The pain is trying to teach us a lesson. Um, I think that's really fascinating because when I go, when I look at things through an evolutionary lens, I'm going to use my horses for an example. There's a type of clover out in the pasture that makes the horses sick and the rest of the clover is fine. There's two, there's three different types of clover. Two of them are fine. One of them is toxic. The horses won't eat the toxic clover. They'll eat <laughs> around it even though it looks like the other clovers, because mm -hmm. they learned that lesson. They learned that lesson. Do humans learn lessons the hard way? And is it because of our neocortex? Is it because of our more evolved brain? Why, like, why do we learn lessons the hard way when a horse who has a brain the size of a <laughs> walnut can figure out not to eat the bad clover? Well, well, because we're, our biological brains are being faked out. For okay. example, I, I used to work with um, a food bar manufacturer that was very famous. I'm not going to give you their name so I don't get sued. And I became very friendly with the vice president of marketing as he was leaving the company. And he kind of hung his head in shame and told me what the most profitable insight they had was. The most profitable thing they did was to take the vitamins out of the bar and put the money into the packaging instead. Mm -hmm. They made the packaging a very diverse, multicolored, vibrant packaging which in nature would signal that you were eating the rainbow. There's a diversity of micronutrients available. Think of purple cabbage and blueberries and 
you know, deep red tomatoes and yellow carrots. And if you eat the rainbow, you get a diversity of micronutrients, you're going to feel better. Millions of years of evolution have taught us to recognize this. In fact, this is part of the reason that, um, you know, colors look so pretty in paintings and uh, because we're really looking for that diversity of nutrients. And there's a um, kind of a predatory nature of industry has figured out how to fake out our brains like that. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know the names of the fish, but there's this one species of fish that tends to get stuff stuck in its teeth. <laughs> I, I actually do also. So I, and, and there's, there, there's, another, um, there's another little fish that comes along and they have a symbiotic relationship, a mutually beneficial relationship. This other little fish comes along and does a little dance. And the big fish, that's its signal to go into a trance, go open its mouth and the little fish comes and cleans its teeth. They, they both win. But the little fish gets to eat a meal. The big fish gets its teeth clean. It's, it's a win-win. Well, there's a third fish, a predatory fish, a parasitic fish that comes along and learn how to mimic the other little fish's dance. So it faked out the big fish the big fish opens its mouth, at which point the little fish comes in and eats the lips and you know, just really destroys wow. the... And so when you look at that model in nature, it makes sense that you know, what some of these big companies are doing is really predatory. And we have these evolutionary responses that are um, very vulnerable to that kind of thing. So that, mm -hmm. that's what I think is going on. I don't, I don't think we learned the hard way. I think that it's not really a learning, it's a, it's a evolutionary response. Right. And it's an yeah. environmental yeah. thing, right? Yeah, and our, and our wiring too, right? Um, yeah. Like a lot of this is wired in. I think that the, this is gonna be such an esoteric comment, but I'm just gonna go with it. But like when you mentioned the, the rainbow thing, how we are sort of wired to seek out brightly colored foods because we, we have this, this knowledge that that's nourishing. Uh -huh. Okay, here's my here's my esoteric comment. It's very strange. That's probably why when people do like psychedelic drugs, colors look brighter, you know, because we've just kind of zeroed in on maybe our reptilian brain, like, you know, the ego has dissolved and we're just we're just kind of cruising around in our little lizard brains and we're noticing colors more. <laughs> That's really okay. interesting. I feel yeah. I feel like I should talk like Chishin Chong now, but that's, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's really well, interesting, the, man. But, you know, we can take a look at like dogs, for example. Uh -huh. Right. Um, these are domesticated animals that are fed what we feed them. And when you when you feed a dog, like my dog will go to town on an entire bag of chips if it's sitting there. But when it comes to her actual like real food, dog food, she eats till she's not hungry and then she stops. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so you give a in any animal a junk food that's going to hit that dopamine trigger or whatever it is, it's the environment that matters. And this is where we get back to coaching. If we know that at the end of the day, we've got the wrong things around us that are going to trigger the reptilian brain and make it difficult for the mammalian brain and the neocortex to manage that from the standpoint of just sort of being prepared and creating a better environment. That's what's, I mean, I'm sorry, when I go to the grocery store, this is why a lot of times it might make more sense to just order your groceries instead of going to the grocery store and seeing all the little Debbies and everything everywhere. Just order what it is you need and that's what's in the house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so this is kind of where these are, these are logistical coaching cues that are going to, I guess, tee up the psychological side of what we do, right? Dealing with sort of the logistical side and the, um, and kind of then making room to kind of be able to work within the psychological side, but coaches are not psychologists, right? We're not therapists, but we can have a conversation and be quiet and listen and give the opportunity to shine a light on what it is the client really needs to talk about. You know, so I would love from you as the psychologist who's training coaches, what kind of skills are you talking about um, well, you know, that coaches you know, can, can use? I mean, first of all, it's kind of funny. When I first started growing the agency, I tried to hire psychologists who didn't have enough work because I know a lot of them. I'm really good at evaluating them. And I found they didn't get it. Hmm. They, they, they had to have, because they naturally go to the depth psychology part. Oh, really? You know, what, what else was going on with your mom back then? 
And, you know, how does it make you feel? And I find that that's a distraction from overcoming overeating. And the empirical evidence suggests that it's very cognitive behavioral techniques and maybe some SSRIs that help people with binge eating. So what we're doing is along the line of cognitive behavioral stuff. But, um, you know, my, my system is actually pretty simple. You, you, you want to start with one simple rule. It's something that you could and would do that would make a big difference and make you feel like you turn the ship around. You probably won't lose weight in the first week or two when you do this, but you'll win. You'll get your spirit back. People don't realize how much their pig is breaking their spirit every time it says just one bite and we'll start tomorrow. It starts to make people feel like it's not possible to craft the body they want, craft the life that they want. And so you want to give them the experience of having one simple rule that they can follow. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, a guy, a truck driver, ate at fast food restaurants all day long. He said, I'm not going to stop eating at fast food restaurants for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I can't, but I won't go back for seconds. And great. So he, he proceeded to win at that game. And he lost 150 pounds eventually, not, not with just that rule, but that's what, that's what got his spirit back. That's what reclaimed his spirit. Other people will say, I will always put my fork down between bites. Mm -hmm. Some people will say, I'll never eat in front of a screen again. Mm -hmm. um, some people will say, I will always stop consuming calories after eight o'clock unless I'm out socializing. Mm -hmm. um, some, some simple thing that's not going to take away all the fun things that you're eating and be you know, this really, really high bar to aim for, which your pig wants you to aim for because eventually you'll fail and then just go back and binge. But something you can actually sustain. And then once you draw that line, start listening for your, your pig to throw up the cravings and tell you to break it. Expect that. Um, some people think there's something wrong when they have cravings. There's actually something right when you have cravings because the only way to overcome cravings is to go through them. Mm -hmm. you, the, the way the extinction process works in, in behaviorism is that the old impulse arises, the reinforcement is withdrawn. Sometimes there's punishment added, but I don't do that. And you experience the craving, it drops down. You experience the craving, it drops down. It doesn't really go down in a straight line. There's a honeymoon period, if you look at the research, and then like between four and seven days afterwards, there's a real spike, like your lizard brain is having a temper tantrum. Mm -hmm. And then it goes down mostly. And then there's a little spike after that before it goes away. But the only way out is through. Mm -hmm. So, and I forgot how I got there. I'm sorry. I no, this is no, an that's a great point, though. This is an excellent coaching cue, actually, what you've offered up here. Um, so imagine if you're on the phone with a client. And the reason why I can imagine this is because this literally happens on virtually all of my client calls. In fact, it just happened yesterday. I had a coaching call with a client who I hadn't heard from in a couple of weeks. And uh, my, my clients meet with me on a weekly basis. We meet over the phone. So I reached out to her and I said, hey, I haven't heard from you in a little while. And her response over the, for the email was, well, I, I totally fell off the wagon. I don't see any point in you know, I said, no, no, let's get on the phone. So, so when, when the client comes on the phone and they're experiencing this shame and guilt, here's what I wrote down when you're, you're sharing this. It was like, this is such a cool uh, coaching cue. It's like, what, what one thing, what one thing could happen this week that would sort of uh, give you your spirit back? It would feel like a win for you this week over this, this, and then what's one rule that we can make to get you that win? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's an incredible coaching tool. It's mm -hmm. not about like, it's, it's not about like, they're there. You're not a bad person because, you know, you just, you know, it just, sometimes is what I gravitate to sort of cheerleading or pep talking, but that's not really actionable. Mm -hmm. And this sort of like, let's make, let's brainstorm one rule that you can implement this week that will give you that. Simple thing. It's, it's not simple going thing. to, it's not going to, it's not going to, you know, solve your weight loss problem in this week, but it's going to give you that win. It's going to give you a little bump in momentum. I think that's totally valuable coaching too. I love that. I really you. appreciate you sharing that. Thank yeah. you. It's very been nice. very effective. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I will also a... usually ask them at the moment because they're usually coming to me telling them they can't do this. They can't stop binging. I'll say, do you have any food in your mouth right this very moment? <laughs> um, on occasion, someone says yes. And I'll say, could you go spit that out? And I'll say, <laughs> I'll say, do you have food in your mouth right this very moment? And they'll say no. And I say, well, it's possible for at least a moment that you can stop binging. Yeah. And they kind of laugh and then they're more open to developing the one role. Okay. Okay. So that that's really good. I, I love this. I, I was just commenting that 
I was thinking to myself and I commented, I think on my Instagram yesterday that, and kind of what to what Laura's question was earlier is like a big part of a massive part of health coaching is n- not really about solving people's food problems. It's about changing their, how they self-identify or not, not us changing it, but, but nurturing that change in self-identity with the client, co-creating it in, in a manner. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to cravings though, like this is a can of worms, mm-hmm. not that people are craving cans of worms. That would be weird, but <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because people, like, I'm, I'm thinking that's because I'm deficient. In I'm, tired of, I'm, I'm just really honest, tired of hearing that. It's like, I don't think it's because you're deficient in magnesium. I don't think that's, I mean, maybe it is, but whatever. Is there, do you have a method to, do you have a method to short circuiting like actually f- short circuiting cravings? And the reason I, this came up in my notes is because when you shared your, what was it, your kale smoothie? That a banana, you made? Kale. kale banana smoothie, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, so when you have a, whatever craving, you make this kale banana smoothie. This is a technique I've been using with my clients for a while. I want to know from your perspective, if it's like on point or if it's just like, not really, Mm -hmm. if you're craving something. So cravings are typically for these hyper palatable engineered foods that, you know, just right into the dopamine Mm -hmm. centers. I've said to my clients, let's brainstorm a list of really pleasurable food experiences that aren't in that, whatever salty, crunchy, sweet, whatever the craving is you're having, Mm -hmm. but you really love them. Maybe it's something very savory unctuous, like an olive or cured Uh meat or something like, so you're going to answer your, your brain's craving for this experience, but you're not going to answer it with what it's asking for. Uh In my head, that, that sort of short circuits, that sort of conditioned response. What do you think about that? That can be really helpful. Um, The way that we do that sometimes is to step people down. So suppose um, someone's craving white pizza with salty tomato sauce and, and Parmesan cheese mozzarella cheese, right? So that is salty, fatty, um, Mm -hmm. starchy, right? Salty, fatty, starchy. So I'll say, well, what else is salty, fatty, starchy? That would be a step up in terms of your health goal. So maybe it would be brown rice with tomato sauce that you make at home without quite as much salt or or with some no salt tomato sauce. They have that available these days. And um, maybe some nutritional yeast that gives you a little bit of a cheesy flavor. Or if that's if that's not okay, maybe there's some type of, uh, you know, whole foods, plant-based cheese that you feel better about than the cheese that you were, the other cheese you were having. Um, so we kind of step them down. And then at the next level, we'll say, well, you know, what if you, uh, what if you didn't have the brown rice? What if it was a sweet potato instead? And which just kind of um, stair-step them to where they want to be like that. Sometimes that works. That's not really my specialty, that part. Um, I, I, I tend to do better with the people who, um, they either want to, sometimes people who feel totally out of control with a particular substance are able to regulate it when they put boundaries and specific decisions about it beforehand. Mm -hmm. So for example, this happens with bread a lot with my clients. Some people will make a rule that say, I will never eat bread except for a restaurant on the weekends when I might have, you know, two pieces before dinner. And The reason a lot of people are able to do that, some people can't, is because you've taken out decision-making in the environment of temptation. Um, Willpower is the ability to make good decisions. We only have so much willpower every day. So when you say, I will only have bread on Saturdays in a restaurant and just two slices, then you've made your decisions all week long for the bread. And then you get to that environment, you could do it, it's over. And... You, know, you have a little bit of a sugar high and low when you do that, but um, but a lot of people can get through it like that. Yeah. So that I, I am I am more successful with people with cravings like that. I'm also more successful, a lot more successful, helping them, them understand that they're not going to endure the craving forever. When a craving comes up, it's usually along with this little voice that says, "This is I'm going to torture you until you give in. You you can't live like this forever." Um, part of what's happening is that you have down-regulated your pleasurable response system. So when you're exposed to a supersized stimulus, like sleeping underneath the subway when I was in graduate school, you initially have a toxic reaction to it. Like I just couldn't sleep, right? After two weeks, I couldn't hear the subway because my nervous system downgraded the response. Same things happens to sugar. Mm -hmm. If you have a chocolate bar every day, you're not going to taste the natural sweets in 
apples, you won't be able to taste the difference between a Fiji and a Gala and a delicious apple. Um, you, won't, you won't get pleasure from the things that nature has to offer. But if you remove the chocolate bar or just have it once a week, you'll find that your nervous system starts to upregulate again. And so for that reason, people who um, overcome overeating and they let go of these supersized stimuli, they tell me that they enjoy their food more than they ever did before. Um, it's just because your body's natural response to things is, is, is better, it's, it gets better. So I have, a lot of, I have a lot of luck explaining that to people and say, look, if you can just get through this period where you're gonna feel bored, life without super stimulus, super, super stimuli feels boring when you first encounter it because you're, you're used to all the super stimulation, but six weeks later, it's going to be much, much, much better. So oh, gosh, yeah, you're seriously like so many questions are spilling forth, but I just want to summarize what you just said there, because folks who are struggling with cravings have probably never, maybe, well, not never, but rarely let the craving just mellow out. They're like, yeah. I'm craving it. I'm going to go. They're probably answering it every time. And so you, as a coaching question you could ask is, have you ever tried or went, tell me about a time when you've not answered a craving. Have or, you ever gone for 30 days without sugar? Yeah. Have you ever done that? Done a 30 day experiment? What was that I, like? Yeah. Yeah. So or a question you could ask your clients, would you, be, would you be open to, would you be open to the next time this craving comes um, sitting with it? And seeing what happens to it without, without, if you don't answer it just as an experiment, because mm -hmm. no, people don't do that. They think they're powerless to their cravings. Oh, I'm having this craving. I'm going to have to go satisfy it. Yeah. But, but to your point, it's like, maybe that craving would be there and gone in, in three minutes. If you just, mm -hmm. or who knows, right. And they don't know how to make the space between stimulus and response. So their, mm -hmm. their experience of life is like a riderless horse, you know, like, like mm -hmm. there, there's no them there and we exist between stimulus and response. Yeah. So anything you can do exactly what you're saying, Aaron, exactly what you're saying. Well, and I, I love the, I wrote it down, you know, that there's, there's something very right about cravings and that really the only way to get past them is through them. There are so many people, you know, and, and I, I think this is a lot of, this is true for a lot of people. Um, you know, look, poor Brad, Aaron, I talk about him all the time. Okay. So he's, I mean, so he's, is that your husband? Yes. He's an, yeah. he's an, he's an alcoholic, hasn't touched a drop of alcohol in over eight years since I was pregnant with our girls, but he, I, he knows he's an addict. He knows this about himself and he tells himself this and he tells everybody around him, essentially like, I don't drink, I'm an alcoholic because it removes the temptation to just go have one drink with this person. Cause if this person knows he's an alcoholic, this person's not going to have the expectation for Brad mm -hmm. to sit down and have a drink with him. Right. So he states this, he owns it. He doesn't view it as anything negative anymore. It just is, right? Mm -hmm. But he also has these addictive tendencies about other things. And for him, man, he's just got to go cold turkey. If he's trying to quit something, he mm -hmm. cannot moderate it. Does mm -hmm. not work, mm -hmm. you know? But what does work well for him is kind of a replacement, trying to find something else that he can focus on to get through whatever that is, that particular craving. You know, um, that works really well for him. Um, just kind of, so there are things that he can just sort of white knuckle it. So a lot of times when he's I, like, I can see when he kind of wants something, he recently just kind of gave up pot recently. He has a tendency to go back and forth with this because for him, again, somebody that suffers from depression and anxiety, this is kind of like a self, um, it's like a treatment for him. You know, it's like he's self-medicating with it, but he and there are so many people that say pot's not addictive. Well, you know what? To an addict, it is. Sorry, it is. Um, so he's gone off of it. And I, I can just tell. So we'll go do something active together. We're active people. He's an athlete. He likes to do that. So we'll go ride a bike. We'll take the go. And, and I'll, the other thing that really saves him is our girls. Is he'll be like, he'll get out and play with them and try to find something to occupy him and ride it out. Um, so there's, there's a lot about that, but not, not everybody has that kind of support system. This is where coaching comes in. And I'm wondering if you have some tips because look, we're not with our clients 24 seven, you know, and unless that, that coach is going to be the hotline that you can call me at three o'clock in the morning, if you have to, to try to keep you away from the cookie dough in the fridge, first of all, why is the cookie dough there? But you know what I mean? 
Um, do you have any thoughts around kind of what, what kind of cues maybe coaches can use with clients when, when they're not there um, that you've seen work well? Well, anything that activates the parasympathetic system. The so, parasympathetic. Yeah. So a lot of people tell me that they stopped binging when they started doing yoga. Mm. So what, what if you indulge yourself in, you know, 20 minute yoga session whenever you had a craving? Um, I, I'm not someone who could ever meditate. I just can't sit still. I, I, I can do yoga. I, I just can't sit still to meditate. Um, but people who do meditate, uh, if they can indulge themselves for that 20 minutes, that really helps. Um, Interestingly, just two five-minute breaks per day where you're not making decisions. There's research on willpower that suggests that, that we need periods of time to restore our willpower by stepping out of, and that, that means responding to email, that means who's taking, you know, little Joni to the soccer game today. You really need five minutes, at least five to 10 minutes twice a day where you're stepping out of the decision loop. Um, there's research that suggests that people eat more marshmallows if they're forced to do math problems before they're available. Um, so it's any type of decision making, if you can step out of that for a couple of times, try to get more sleep. Um, it's a, a lot of the self-care, a lot mm -hmm. of the self-care. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Parasympathetic state stuff is, I'm folding it more into my health coaching practice because I just don't think you can be human fully human if you're not tapping that parasympathetic half every right. time. Right. So I literally have a million more questions. I personally have whittled my last questions down to two. So okay. I'm not going to, you know, cause we are, <laughs> Laura, you might have some more questions too, but I'm going to try to rein myself back to two more questions. Okay. My questions are about hunger and hedonism. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with hunger first. Mm -hmm. We'll save the good one for last. <laughs> okay because I, I jotted this down when you were talking and, and this is kind of where I approach behavior change with my clients and, and my clients are probably trying to lose weight or just get con control. They're trying to achieve an effortless relationship with food. That's kind of what I, what I offer in my practice. Mm -hmm. I know that's kind of a vague statement. It's no, not, it's it. not so, yeah, it's, it's not, I'm not specializing in binge eating so much and like, like you're describing, but folks who are just kind of like when you were telling your, your Genesis story, but like you're preoccupied, like the whole front of your brain was like, you know, I'm not talking about proper neurophysiology here, but you know, okay. So the, the way I approach this behavior change stuff is like, well, let's get you really well fed. Let's just make sure you're super, super nourished with very nutrient dense, bioavailable and, human nutrition, and, because that will just quieten the call for whatever treats you. So you can absolutely. peacefully coexist. So you think there's something to that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, good. I'm on the right track. Excellent. <laughs> Now, my question about hedonism. Oh, that was the whole question? That was the whole question. I just want to have <laughs> a confirmation. And please, please elaborate okay. if, you, if you want to. The question, my question is like, is solving for hunger one of an effective way for solving for yeah. binge yeah. eating? And it's like, um, I once heard, I heard this from Jack Trimpe. He was the first one who clued me into this. Um, when a smoker feels an incredible craving, if they could step outside into fresh air and take three deep breaths and sigh it out, then they're, they're much better off. Um, it's because of the biological error that the survival drive is making, which was craving the, the stuff. Um, and I talked about the kale banana smoothie already. So yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, need, you need to feed your authentic needs. You have to take care of yourself. There are some rules you can't make. Like I couldn't make a rule that said, I will never pee again because my bladder would say otherwise in six to 12 hours, right? Maybe sooner, I'm 57 years old. Um, you can't make rules that overly restrict your biological needs. Like some people will say, uh, the most extreme will be, I want to become a breatharian. I want to use your technique to become a breatharian and live in nothing but air. And I said, I'm sorry, but I can't help you with that. Uh, a some people will say, well, can you teach me how to live on 500 calories a day? And I, pro I probably can't do that either. You have to take care of your authentic needs. Yeah. I want to say one more thing about hunger, though, because a, a very common approach is to learn how to eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full. Yeah. Some people can do that and some people can't. W what I want you to understand is that industry is spending a fortune to break your biological hunger and food, and food meters right? 
So we don't really know when we're full. Is it good to learn how to do that by being more mindful? Yes. Is it good to teach yourself to eat mindfully? Yes. But we live in a world where, where first of all, it's very difficult to tune into that. And secondly, we have too many things impinging on us. We can't walk around being mindful all day long. We, we just can't. So I tell people to find, it's like if you were a city traffic planner and you're trying to balance the um, freedom of the populace to move through the city against the safety of the populace to be protected from accidents, that's what you want to do with your own personal set of food rules is you want to figure out where are the dangerous intersections, put stoplights and, you know, and, and stop signs up there or yield signs, whatever's appropriate. And then enjoy yourself as you drive through the city, which probably gets the hedonism. I find people enjoy their food more when they're not frightened, they're going to be out of control. Oh, yeah. so they, they find the difficult intersections. And then I, I daydream when I'm driving around, I listen to music. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I enjoy food more than I've ever enjoyed it before, because I know I'm not going to get in trouble with it. I think that uh, I'm, I'm putting together some of what you shared here and, and maybe I stumbled across like a cool, so, so what I tell what I encourage my clients to do, because to your point, you know, cult culturally, um, the big food, you are environmentally, if, if, the, if the spouse is bringing the Oreo cookies home and you're powerless to that, like these, these hyper palatable foods are going to call to you. They just, they're designed to do that. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we use the concepts of this whole like decision fatigue, this sort of willpower fatigue, what I tell my clients is look, just lay down a really good protein forward breakfast. Cause we know protein is highly satiating. If you can just make that one decision in the early part of the day before you're tired, you know, then maybe we can hedge our bets on the side of being more well-fed such that later on in the day, you can just have maybe your wits about you more when it comes when you're presented. Critical. Yeah. yeah. Yep. yeah. I've also found, we, we wrote a book on nighttime overeating because so many people were complaining oh, about yes. it. It seems to be the hardest rule for people to follow because that's when your willpower is lower. Mm. Um, we've to date not been able to get people to stop nighttime overeating unless they're willing to have breakfast. I find most nighttime overeaters don't want to eat breakfast. And so the exact tip that you, get, you mm -hmm. gave them um, seems to be critical for nighttime overeaters. You know, I'm curious about that because I've, I've had people try, you know, intermittent fasting and not eating in the morning and uh, they find they're craving carbohydrates later when they do that, you know? So, I mean, just bio, biologically, biochemically, everybody's got a different gut microbiome. Everybody has different tendencies towards addiction and, and just, we're all so different that there's no one size fits all approach to all of this stuff. And, and then we have to get to the root of why are you intermittent fasting? Well, when, I'm trying to lose weight. Okay. Well, you know, then you, you have to kind of unpack all of this stuff and helping them understand what all that means. And okay, well, if intermittent fasting isn't working for you and you're not losing weight, then clearly that's not the tool. <laughs> so yeah, that's, yeah. you know, kind of rethink the direction you're going. And, and to Aaron's point, um, that, that tremendously protein forward breakfast can do the trick for so many people. It doesn't necessarily have to be at seven o'clock in the morning, you know, whenever you're hungry to your, to your term, you know, eat when you're hungry, stop with when you're not. I agree with you. I think there's a lot of people that have, they think hungry, um, they think not hungry means stuffed. That's my husband. Mm -hmm. Like I'm in pain. I can't eat anymore. That means I'm not hungry. And yeah. I'm like, no, 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 you know, and I, and I'm not quite sure how to dial that back other than just to kind of slow things down. And, and rather than making this a meal that you're rushing through, it's very easy to get there. Putting your what? fork down between bites was one great way. Having only eating around other people and having a conversation when possible, being more mindful. So Laura, what I tell people about, and this is what we find about, um, learning to eat when you're hungry and stuff when you're full is that you need external objective controls for six months or so. You, you, you can't rely on your subjective feelings for the first six months or so as you're going to stop binge eating. Same with intermittent fasting. I find that intermittent fasting doesn't really work to help people to stop overeating uh, for the first six months or so. And actually I have a good friend who runs a podcast all about intermittent fasting. And she told me that it seems not to work for people when the first beginning to stop overeating because they have a lot of junk in their system. But once their systems are cleaner, then it's easier to do that. So I, I do have success with people intermittent fasting, but not until they're six months or a year past their overeating habits. 
Yeah. 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 We, they've got to be, I'm sorry, Aaron, go ahead. I always tell my clients, cause the clients will come to me saying, what about fasting? It's like, before you learn how to fast, you have to learn how to eat. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Okay. Okay. My, my final, my final question, this is just for me. I'm going to, I'm putting the brakes on myself because otherwise Dr. Livingston, you will never get out of here. <laughs> um, but Laura, feel free to, to keep going. This is not, my final question is about is lots of semantics here coming at you. Okay. So my question is about hedonism and it, it sort of relates to this idea of this moderator abstainer, I guess, di- you know, dichotomy, mm-hmm. which I personally struggle with because I guess I personally struggle with it because I'm neither of those things. I'm not a moderator and I'm not an abstainer. I'm an abstinent moderator or moderate abstainer type. And so I've come to this, this line of thinking, and I would love to just know your opinion, truly that humans have, have humans are driven by the pursuit of pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to satisfy it sometimes Mm -hmm. and, 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 but with a temperate approach, a temperate approach to satisfying. So this is where I go back to my grown ass adult commentary because mm-hmm. a grown ass adult can have ice cream for dinner if they want, but they mm-hmm. wouldn't, mm-hmm. you know, really they wouldn't, you know, but you know, we know that like our hunter gatherer ancestors, if they came across the honey hive, they were eating the whole thing. They weren't mm-hmm. moderating their intake of the honey. They were just going to eat it all because it's there. It's sweet. It's yummy. They're going to store it easily for food scarcity later. So I do feel like we are wired for the pursuit of pleasure and for, and I think we are hedonistic animals Mm -hmm. and there's something to be said about practicing temperance. What do you think about that? Um, I think that you want to maximize freedom and hedonism to the extent that you can, and you can eat anything that you want to, if you're willing to live with the consequences. Um, I think that the nature of our programming, um, it's one thing to come across a honey hive. It's another thing to come across, you know, something that has 10 tablespoons of processed sugar in it and in a little small can or something like that. Um, and I think that we do well to recognize our weak points. And most people start by trying to be temperate with their weak points. So, um, and I don't care. Whatever works for you is uh, my, my whole program is diet agnostic, and I find two out of three of my clients will be, you know, temperate moderators, and one out of three of them has to, has to stop. And it varies from substance to substance. I can't have chocolate. Um, I, I can have flour if I really want to. Most of the time, I don't want to because it doesn't feel good in my system, um, but I can if I, if I really want to. I'll, I'll plan it out, and I'll, you know, say I'm going out for dinner, and I'll have a day, and I'll have some flour. Um, so I'm not here to take away anybody's pleasure or their right to pleasure. I am here to say you can live beyond the pleasure principle, that society is anti-instinctual in in and of itself, that to function well in society, we have to have the ability to suppress and redeploy our impulses in more constructive ways. Um, I think that being a grown-ass person is uh, means that you recognize that and you develop that ability and then you make choices about when you want to express this and what you don't based upon the consequences that you want. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I would fight. We fought wars for our freedom in this country and I would fight for your right to eat six chocolate bars if that's what you really want to do. Uh, one phrase that you just used that I absolutely love is this idea of redeploying our impulses. That's a really cool way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I think that impulsivity is akin to hedonism, maybe. So it's like, it's fine to have impulses. And it's even probably fine for some people to satisfy them, but not all the time. You just, mm-hmm. not all the time. You just can't do it all the time. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess my kind of parting question for you is, um, you know, there's, there's, she's not a client of mine. She's someone I care for but I'm too close to her to be her coach. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many times I've had conversations with her on just how defeated she sounds, that she sounds hopeless. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, I can't coach her, but, um, and I know other coaches have either other personal relationships or other clients that, I don't know, I guess what I would love to hear from you are just some, words of hope, I guess, on how to 
when, when faced with a conversation like this, is the best thing just to listen? Um, it depends upon the person. Yeah. You, ha you have to look for a way in. You can't just yeah. tell people what to do because they run away screaming. It's, mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I forgot, was it Margaret Mead that said it's easier to change a person's religion than to change their diet? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. Um, when people talk to me about it, I ask them, have the other ever had the experience where they fought a war with a bagel and lost, like there was an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder? They usually say yes. Um, and then I say, well, what if I could show you a way where the angel wins most of the time, if not all the time? And they get a little interested. And I'll explain a little bit about, you know, the devils you're really talking about is the reptilian brain and the angel is mm -hmm. a different part of the brain. And there are techniques for getting up into your upper brain. If they're interested, then I send them to the free copy of my book. And I say, read the first three chapters. If this is interesting, call me back and I'll, I'll talk to you about it. Um, that's, that's my approach with it. Um, I found mm -hmm. that um, the people in my personal life who saw my transformation, you know, because I used to be a whole bunch fatter and I had rosacea and, and they, they say, well, your skin looks really healthy. And right now I'm a little, I got sunburned, but. Um, um, brag, brag, brag. <laughs> Oh, uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm in Canada. Oh, no. Oh, no. Go I'm going to New Hampshire next week. So I, it's going to be the first time I've seen snow in, in three years. Um, so I, I find that I have more influence over the people that saw the transformation than the people who just meet yeah. me right now. Um, but you, you got to look for the way in. You got to ask them if it's working out okay for them. And, you know, yeah. and you have to ask their permission for everything. You can't just start. And I usually tell people, not to start the conversation by saying what food is healthy and what food isn't healthy, because then immediately the person has their back up and they don't want to give up their favorite thing. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I love that. Look, look for the way in because I've finally one day I just said, um, you know, what is it that you want from me? Mm -hmm. She knows what I do. Mm -hmm. um, because I've given her advice. She just doesn't, she never takes it. And then she beats herself up that she never takes it. And it's, I've encouraged her. I've tried to refer her, but um, I guess it's just finding the right thing that'll click the way in. Maybe it's referring her to your book. Um, I'm, I mean, I don't mean to be self-promotional. What, what no, um, I, I will be self-promotional at the end if that's okay. But, yeah. but, but um, just because people ask for advice doesn't mean they want it or that they're ready to take it. Yeah. So yeah. You, you need to develop as, as a coach, you need to develop a kind of um, less impulsivity about, oh boy, maybe this is a client and ask, ask more questions. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what would it mean to you if I could do that? What, why would you want that advice right now in your life? What's going on in your life right now that might make that advice worthwhile? Um, why not before? Why mm -hmm. didn't you come to me before? You got to find out about their motivations and their personality. Yeah. So you see, you see how you can uh, you can approach them. Yeah. 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 So, so um, let's, let's talk about your, your work. I would love to, for people to know where to find you, where to find perhaps the, the free copy of your book, where to buy your book. I would love to find out about your program on how you're coaching other coaches. Yeah, sure. Lay it on us. Sure. Um, you get to everything at neverbingeagain.com and just sign up for the reader bonus list by clicking the big red button. When you do that, you will get a set up well you'll get the book in the kindle nook or pdf format the digital copies are free um, the paperback and the audible copies are there's a charge for that um, but you can get this the same book same exact mm -hmm. book actually that's not entirely true in the audible version there are more demonstration sessions at the end oh, um, cool. yeah. we we provide people with about a half dozen demonstration sessions when they sign up for the reader bonus list so you'll hear, and you'll hear there's a system to the, the whole thing. You'll, you'll hear the demonstration sessions and the way that we do this. It starts out with a general podcast interview um, with the guy who introduced me to the world six years ago. Um, and then there were a bunch of demonstration sessions. And there's a set of food plan starter templates. So whatever dietary philosophy you're following, we're, we're diet agnostic. Mm -hmm. So whether you're ketogenic or you know point counting, calorie counting, vegan, whatever you're doing, we have a set of food plan starter templates. I call it that because 
I'm not a dietitian or a medical doctor. And also because I find that people have to take responsibility for their own plan. Yes. Like, because if you, if I give you a diet to follow, maybe you'll follow it for a little while. And then your pig is going to say that doctor's diet's no good. We're going to have to go back to binging until we can find another one. Right. But if you think it through and come up with it, come up, come up with it on your own, you're much more likely to follow it. So neverbingeagain.com, click the big red button. You'll also be directed on, you know, on the products and services page if you're curious about uh, training in this method. I would suggest you listen to a half a dozen coaching sessions first before you okay. consider that. Great. Okay. That's awesome. Great. What a great resource. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you. Oh, I want to tell you, I, I want to t thank you. And also just, um, I want to thank you because you've given me tools in this conversation to add to my coaching conversations. And I'm just going to be devouring your website. And I just, I just downloaded the audible. So I'll be listening to that on my nature. My, oh, uh, cool. Karen, talk about impulse control Boom, downloaded before we ever even got it. <laughs> it, it it's in my voice. I did my best. I did my, I'm, I'm not an actor or a voiceover person, but it's in my voice. Oh, wonderful. So, oh, that's okay. 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 I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much, doc. This was so great. Um, this will be one of those episodes that I would share with the public too, in addition to other coaches and people that Wonderful. really kind of identify as, Hey, I'm a binge eater. I, I think, Wonderful. um, I think you've got some really amazing things to say. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anytime. Awesome. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.